I don't want to take too much time from you, Jared. Uh, this is our first um, of the year SPYC Leadership Series meeting where we've had someone uh, in the hospitality industry speak. So definitely unique to what we typically do and how we host these meetings um, because of SPYP. But I thought um, bringing Jared on today would give us some really good perspective as to what's going on in the hospitality industry right now, um, what we can expect moving forward, um, and then in return, you know, sharing a little bit more um, with us about what we can do, you know, as a group, as a community to help support the industry. So um, I, I love I love these meetings. We we get to do them monthly, and so it's you know really exciting to bring people from the community. Um, on board where we can connect, you know, on different levels. So with that being said too, we have another one coming August 20th, which I'm looking forward to, leadership coach Cheryl Bonini-Ellis. And so it'll be a part discussion, part workshop on creating personal value proposition for career resilience. So I know we'll get to hear a little bit about that today um, from your side, Jared, but then also too, um, as a whole. Um, for next month as well. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce you guys to Jarrett. He's the owner of Intermezzo Coffee and Cocktails. Jarrett, welcome to our SPYP community. How's it going, guys? Can everyone can everyone hear me? Because I actually just got audio like 10 seconds ago, so I missed <laughs> the introduction, but I'm sure it was a good one. Um, yeah. So so cool. All right. So now that we're we're all plugged in. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Jared Sabatini. Uh, I own Intermezzo Coffee and Cocktails. We're on Central Avenue. Um, I was just say across the street from Bodega because I've been here longer than I have. Um, so I opened up. Uh, you know, I'll just give a brief in introduction, and then we'll talk a little bit a little bit about COVID and how it's affected us and how it's affected uh, the hospitality industry as a whole. So. I opened up about three and a half years ago, going on four years now. And, uh, you know, when we opened, we were just a coffee shop. We were actually just a pop-up coffee shop, meaning I only had a three month lease. It was only supposed to be sort of a test run uh, while I look for a more permanent space. And, um, you know, the fortunate things happened. I was able to get a long-term lease there. Uh, we went from coffee to cocktails about five months later, we were able to get a liquor license. And my background was in uh, wine and cocktails before I got into coffee, actually. And so it was very well integrated. And so we became, you know, Intermezzo Coffee to Intermezzo Coffee and Cocktails. And so uh, so now we're here three and a half years later, uh, a little bit of a different situation going on, obviously, uh, but fortunate to still be here. And, um, and yeah, I came here, moved here about seven years ago and went to University of South Florida, St. Pete. So so we'll just jump right into it. So um, what I want to do is kind of talk a little bit about what happened and then sort of end up where we're at right now. And so, um, you know, a lot of this obviously started happening uh, January, February, and then really started to peak in March. And so, um, you know, I remember in February, um, you know, hearing about the outbreak going on and things going on in China, some travel restrictions and not taking it very seriously and not paying too much attention to it. And I think a lot of the world was on that same page. And in early March, I remember being at um, Green Bench Brewery, which is right behind us. And there was an art show going on. It was March 11th. I think it was a Wednesday. And there's people out and we're having a good time and the world seemed totally fine. And I think it was that day that, you know, the New York Times posted an article that said that Tom Hanks got coronavirus. And I was sort of joking at it because, again, at that time, I knew it was like quasi serious, but I didn't know how serious it really was. And thinking like, wow, I can't believe this actually made, you know, a big, a big headline. And then, uh, you know, three days later, Green Bench canceled their biggest beer event, which is one of the biggest beer events in, in, in the, the state of Florida. It's called Fooder for Thought. I was like, oh, wow, okay, this is pretty serious. So that was on March 14th. On March 17th, that's when Florida closes all the bars and clubs, and they reduce restaurants down to 50%. And so obviously it got very real for us because, uh, you know, I would say 70% of our revenue comes from being a bar, not just from being a coffee shop. 
so while we get a lot of people in from coffee, obviously it's a, it's a much smaller ticket average and et cetera. And a lot of people now know it's only for cocktails. And so, um, so that was a pretty big, pretty big uh, moment, right? When, when you're like, okay, you're forced to close. And fortunate for us, we, we sort of are on this, this gray area where we're coffee shop, where we're also a bar, we serve some food. And so we are able to kind of maneuver with it. Uh, the very next day, March 18th, um, another headline, you know, there's a famous restaurant tour in New York named Danny Meyer, who is sort of like the father of hospitality, modern hospitality, I would say. He owns several um, of the best restaurants in the world, all in New York City. He also founded Shake Shack, which is what he's most known for now, probably. And uh, he laid off 80% of his staff, which is 2,000 people. And so, um, so this happens, right? Um, I also am looking up some research. I see that in March, you know, downloads of grocery store apps go up to over 200%. So all these things are happening, right? Restaurants are shutting down. People are staying at home. People are cooking at home and all these things. And so um, immediately, I, you know, as a business, we start to react, you know. So the first thing that we do is we start to pivot a little bit, right? To use that term that everyone's beginning to use, but we sort of pivot to start doing more stuff to go. And we, we incorporate a retail wine program, right? So there's not too much we can do because what we did is we, we closed from eight, um, we, we were staying open from eight to 3 p.m., but we're closing after that. And so I didn't know how long this was gonna last. I thought it was only gonna be a couple of weeks. So I'm like, okay guys, we're gonna temporarily close. We're gonna start some, some retail items. Um, it, it didn't really do much, right? Like we're talking 20 bottles of wine for 15 bucks just to get some revenue in the door, just to, yeah, oh, people are gonna stay home for a couple of weeks. It's not gonna be a big deal. Well, it turned out not to be the case, of course. Um, you know, obviously skip ahead a few months. In early June, we have our second phase of reopening. Um, so the whole state of Florida is like, you know, the bars are getting ready. They're ordering produce, breweries. Uh, in a minute, I'll talk a little bit about it. I talked to one, the owner of Green Bench about how his reopening, but breweries are beginning to brew product. But we're hiring people on, da, da, da. Okay, things might turn out to be good. As we know, we have a second wave. Um, and then June 26th, the Department of Business and Professional Regulation, without any notice whatsoever, actually tweets out that they're going to uh, suspend all on-premise consumption uh, in bars. Okay, and if you're a restaurant, you're allowed to stay open, 50% still occupancy. Uh, but, you know, that morning they're like, hey, you have to close down by tonight. And so you can imagine how devastating it is um, to, to try to operate a business where if you're the, you know, if you're the owner of your company, you're the owner of your business or CEO of a business, your whole job is to plan for the future, for plan for growth. And so in early June, you're like, okay, things are going to normalize. Let's, let's bring everyone back. Let's get back, you know, all engines up running. And then three weeks later, they're like, shut it all down, right? And so it's been, uh, a lot of the frustration's been this stop and go and stop and go and stop and go. Um, and then of course, you know, in late May and early June, we also had, you know, the death of George Floyd, which sparked a lot of protests around the country. So for, for restaurant owners in particular, not only do you have all these shutdowns, if you're lucky enough to stay open or to get back open, then obviously you have a lot of people trying to stay inside, there's protests going on, people are angry justifiably and et cetera. And so it's been a lot of up and down and a lot of controversy and a lot of stress on these guys. Um, actually yesterday I had a conversation with the owner, he's a good friend of mine, Nathan from Green Bench. I was asking him, you know, what did you do? How did you react, blah, blah, blah. When, they, when this all started, they had about 30 employees. Now they're down to about 13 or 14. Um, their tap room sales, which if you don't know, they extended, they basically doubled the size of their, their, their brewery this year. Uh, so they've been planning this for several years. They finally implemented it. It got built in January, March, they had to shut down. It's a beautiful facility, but they, um, their, their actual on-premise sales, their tap room sales account for about 60% of the revenue. And so all that's gone. Right. And not only did it, does it account for a lot of the revenue, but, a lot of their, their margins, right? The way that it works is their margins on taproom sales help um, sort of supplement their lack of margins on wholesale, right? You don't make as much on wholesale. There's a lot of 
people in between, et cetera. And so not only are they totally done with their tap room, and they had been since March, they, they tried opening back up, and they were forced to shut back down. Um, now they're still shut down to this day, so it's, we're over, over four months now. Um, they're only doing wholesale, and a lot of people think, oh, they're lucky they can still do wholesale. Well, it's actually, they're still you know, hemorrhaging money, and they're still struggling. Um, for example, you know, I talked to him, he said it takes three weeks on average to make a beer. Well, with the way things have been going, you know, every day, you never know what can happen, right? So you go, okay, we're going to make X amount of this product. Uh, so we buy all the inventory, we hire the labor, uh, we're starting to make all this product, which is, you know, it's an agricultural product, so it does have a shelf life. We're two weeks into it, and then on the third week, the state says shut it back down. So now we're sitting on, you know, potentially tens of thousands of dollars or more of inventory. And so, you know, these guys are so frustrated, of course, as, as well as myself and our whole industry, because, and it's nobody's fault, but we just don't know how, how to plan for tomorrow. So we're lit literally having to go from planning, you know, four, five, six months out. And then, of course, for bigger restaurants, you're talking years out to literally having the, what are we doing tomorrow? Are we going to be open tomorrow? Uh, you know, am I going to be able to give my employees a job tomorrow? Um, so it's been, it's been frustrating, um, obviously, as a whole. Um, you know, what, some of the things we've done is, like I said, we've done the retail component. Uh, it has helped a little bit. And so one of the benefits is actually we are going to keep that. Even when things normalize, we're going to have retail wines. We're going to sort of pivot and be more of a bottle shop because I think that the trends may be that people are going to stay home. They're going to be cooking and drinking more at home, at least in the short term. Um, one of the things we did March 19th, actually, in the beginning of all this, was we took this as an opportunity to try to give back. And so we teamed up with uh, another local coffee company, Made Coffee. Uh, they donated uh, a lot of product. We used Intermezzo as a pickup. And so we gave away over 3,000 cans of coffee to first responders right? So nurses, EMT, officers, anybody who's working overtime, especially obviously people in the hospital. Um, and so that was a cool initiative that we were able to give. Um, a week after that, March 27th, uh, the state opened up. We were allowed to do to-go cocktails. So immediately, uh, Intermezzo was actually one of the first ones in the city to start doing to-go cocktails. Um, you know, this is, of course, it takes money to do this. So you have to find the product, you have to, you know, order more inventory, you have to pay a little bit more for these bottles and et cetera. But at this point, you're kind of thinking to yourself, what can we do just to get money in the door? What can we do to turn this sitting inventory into just cash in the bank for reserves? Um, you know, one of the things people don't think about is restaurants are different than a lot of other of these bigger businesses or, or more structured businesses. Most restaurants, especially independent ones, do not have cash flow, right? We, or cash reserves, rather. We go week to week. Uh, and if you're lucky, month to month, right? And so um, a lot of it's reliant on events. A lot of it's reliant on holidays, and birthdays, and and celebrations. Everything where you want to bring people together. But right now, the idea is don't don't get near anybody, right? And so it's the antithesis of hospitality, right? One of the root words of hospitality is hope. And so literally, it's the opposite of hope. It's fear. People are fear, fearful to go out right now. And so, so it's, a, it's a scary time. Um, you know, one of the hardest days, probably the hardest day uh, as a business owner for me, and I've only owned a business for almost, you know, not even four years now, so I'm still pretty new to it, I'd say, is, uh, you know, literally having to tell my staff, hey, guys, look, you know, the, the future is looking grim right now, and we're a small business, and so you know, either like what I did for my staff is I didn't lay everybody off, right? I, I gave people an option. So I said, and this is in the beginning, this is in late March. I said, look, things might look up still, right? I don't know how long it's going to be. I'm willing to keep you on staff. Uh, if you want to work, you can. If you don't want to work, I will still pay you uh, for the next two or three weeks. But after that, our money's pretty much going to be up. Uh, the other option is that, you know, you could you could jump in line right now and get ahead for unemployment. As you know, I'm sure a lot of you have read the articles, et cetera. There's weeks and weeks and weeks for unemployment. And so a lot of them chose to do that because they wanted to get to get to be first in line. Some of them stayed on. Nobody felt comfortable working, which is totally understandable. I actually ran the shop by myself for about four weeks 
So I was there, uh, you know, Sunday to Sunday from eight to three, I was bottling cocktails. I was making coffee. I was talking to people. Obviously volume was very low. At one point I had a projector. I was watching movies. That's how slow it was. Um, and so our revenue went from, well, it were basically at that time we were at 30% of our typical revenue, maybe. And uh, as of today, we're probably back up to 60, 65%. Um, so, so it's been, uh, you know, it's been tough. Um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking just in terms of my own business, of course, but there's over 600,000 restaurants in this country, right? And it, we employ a lot of people. So there's somewhere between, I've heard several numbers, but it, minimum 10 million people up to about 15 million people in the hospitality industry. Uh, most, most of whom are laid off right now. And like I said, Danny Meyer, uh, this is a guy who a lot of people in hospitality look to, to see, okay, w what is his company doing? What are they going to do to lead? Because they're usually one step ahead. Uh, and immediately, as soon as uh, their governor Cuomo shut down, they, they immediately laid off 2000 people. And the reason was, is because, you know, you want to, you want to live the fight another day. You want to be there when when things normalize to hire people back and to still provide a good place to work and so it's a tough decision but if you want to if you want to make it through you have to make these decisions and uh it's sort of a survivalist men mentality right now and um yeah so so it's a it's a it's a two-pronged issue right so the the first is safety and hope and then uh the second is rebuilding people's lives and uh, that's kind of where we're at now obviously the current state is bars are still shut down. Um, Intermezzo is fortunate the way that Florida is right now. Um, well, we're fortunate for a couple of reasons. One is the state says if you have a food license, you can still operate um, as long as you reduce your occupancy to 50%. So we're, we're able to do that in a safe way. Um, and then the second thing is, is that our space, if you've ever been to it, is pretty wide open, tall ceilings, uh, natural light. We keep it clean. We keep it open. We've moved tables around to try to distance people. And obviously we're following all the guidelines. People have to wear masks inside. We're sanitizing often. We provide hand sanitizer, uh, et cetera. And so we're able to stay open, uh, not at our regular, regular occupancy, but we are still open every day now. And we have, you know, 80% of our staff back. Um, some people just don't feel safe right now coming back, which is totally fine if you have, um, if you have any sort of condition, right? Um, so that's kind of what, what happened, right? At least on a local scale. Um, you know, we, we've been, Florida, obviously, it's been up and down, up and down, but in a lot of ways, I do feel fortunate to be here. As long as, you know, as an owner, as a manager, you're responsible and you're taking care of your staff first and your suppliers and your customers, um, you can sort of wiggle your way through this. Of course, it's not been easy. And we, we, we applied, applied for the PPP and we did get that. And that's helped tremendously and that has allowed us to stay open. Uh, but if you're in New York right now, or you're in San Francisco, or you're in Seattle, uh, or Los Angeles, the chances of staying open are, are very slim unless you have, you know, investors willing to come in, which again, you, there's some cost to that. Is it even worth it? Um, it it's, it's very bleak right now. And, uh, and it has been that way. You've, you've seen, re we've seen restaurants and cocktail bars and, and all kinds of things go under uh, after, you know, 40 or 50 years in business, sometimes longer, they just close and uh and and just call it because it's you know it's not worth it so another one of the effects of this um is it's sort of a wake-up call um for example i'm just going to pull up this i had this article pulled up there's a there's a famous restaurant quasi famous restaurant in new york city called prune and it's a uh, two-time james beard a nominated restaurant or awarded restaurant rather uh, it's been in new york city's east village since 1999 Okay, so this restaurant is uh, over 20 years old, and she wrote an article, um, this was early April, well, actually April 23rd, and I'm just going to read uh, a piece of this for you guys very quickly. Uh, it's on the New York Times. If you look up Prune, it's, it's an interesting one. So she says here, I imagined I would tackle my other problems quickly, 
I emailed my banker for sales taxes, liquor invoices, and impending rent. I hope to apply for a modest line of credit to float me through the crisis. I thought having run a two and a half to $3 million a year uh, restaurant every year for the past two decades, that would leave me uh, poised to see a line of cr credit quickly. But then I remembered that I switched banks in the past year. Everyone in my industry encouraged me to apply for an SBA disaster loan. I estimated we wouldn't need much. For 14 days, about $50,000. So I sent in my query. In the meantime, I made a phone call to my insurance broker of 20 years, who explained in his patient, technical, my hands are tied voice that this coronavirus business interruption wouldn't likely be covered. He intended to file for damages as uh, he would if the shutdown had been mandated because of a nearby flood or a fire but he doubted I'd get any money. That afternoon, I saw the courtesy email from our workers comp carrier that the next installment of our payment plan would be drafted automatically from our bank in six days. And a little bit further in the article, she said, the line of credit, credit I thought would be so easy to require turned out to be one long week of harsh, busy signals before I was even able to apply on March 25th. I was turned down a week later on April 1st because of, quote, inadequate business and personal cash flow. I howled with laughter over the phone at the underwriter and his explanation. Everything was uphill. So, you know, here we're talking about a two-time James Beard Award restaurant that's been in one of the most densely populated and popu uh, most popular places in the world in East Village, Manhattan, that can't get a loan that's paying you know, upwards of probably 20 or $30,000 a month in rent for maybe a 1,500 square foot or 1,000 square foot space and has uh, nominations and awards and et cetera, who can't get a line of credit, who has to lay off everybody and who is now coming to the realization that you know, restaurant margins are notoriously thin. And she talks about how when we talk to each other in the industry, we talk about, oh, how's things going? Oh, great, we had our best quarter, et cetera. But we both know that a lot of it is just uh, hyperbole and we're trying to sort of will our way through it because we're passionate and we love our job. But a lot of these margins are very thin, especially in the restaurant world. When you're talking about doing high-end food, it's not easy. Um, so um, I wish I could say sort of, you know, where, what the future is going to look like, but I don't know what tomorrow is going to look like. To be honest, we, you know, uh, are relying on loyal customers. We're trying to do email marketing and specials and get people in the door. You know, the good thing is, is that we're being as safe as possible. We're looking out for our staff is the most important thing for me. Um, and also trying to talk with our suppliers. You know, we're, a lot of the a lot of the people affected by this aren't just restaurants, of course, or, or people in the hospitality industry, but um, but suppliers as in farmers or uh, liquor distillers or brand ambassadors, people who work for liquor companies who have been laid off and et cetera. So it's a ripple effect and it has a lot of effects on different people. And um, so that's kind of where we're at right now. And, you know, people who make it through, I will say are very resilient. Um, but uh, but it, it, it's, a, it's a, like I said, it's a two pronged issue. You want to get open, you want to, keep people's livelihoods in check and you want to hire people, but you also, people want to feel safe and you don't want to appear that you are being uh, unsafe by, by staying open. So it's a very fine line. Of course, it's a contentious time right now as well. So it's, you know, trying times uh, for sure. So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of it. And uh, I mean, I'd love to take any questions if anyone wants to talk more. I mean, I'm sure people have questions, but yeah, yeah, we have a couple of questions on here. Um, really quickly, though, I'm not sure since you mentioned James Beard a couple of times, if everyone mm -hmm. knows what James Beard is, how it came mm -hmm. to be. And then following that, I did post the article link you were referencing on the okay, chat great. too for everyone to be able to click on. Um, I did pass that article uh, a couple months ago, and it is a, a, an interesting read and, and really gives you um, some perspective, but yeah, with that being said, can you start by going into some details to what the James Beard uh, group is? Yeah, I don't know everything about it. I know James Beard himself was a uh, a well-known chef, I think became um, 
it became a accreditation for restaurants, the James Beard Award, and there's the James Beard House in New York City, which um, has obviously the accreditations, but also they provide grants and they provide incentives for restaurants to do as, the best as possible. They actually invite restaurants to New York to cook at the house. Uh, in fact, one of the local restaurants here in town, Il Retorno, a couple of years ago, went and cooked at that house uh, and they sold tickets and it was a great thing for the restaurant to provide some notoriety. Uh, it's, it's an incentive for the chef, uh, you know, like you're doing a good job and we notice it. Um, you know, one of the things is sometimes you feel like you're, you're, you're trying your hardest, you're doing the best you can, but some, you know, as a chef or as an owner, sometimes it doesn't always go as appreciated or in your mind at least. So it's nice to get that nod from a, a really a global community. And so I'm not sure exactly how it started, but I do know that in the restaurant world, if you have a James Beard Award, uh, at which they give away every year. There's several different awards. There's outstanding bar program, outstanding uh, wine list, restaurant. Um, it is, it's considered sort of the holy grail in the restaurant world. So if you, you know, she doesn't have one, but she has two at Prune, uh, which is really a big, big, big achievement. So. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. And so you had mentioned uh, earlier in the conversation that um, you did things to like, quote unquote, pivot and, you know, do to go cocktails. I do remember you guys being one of the first to do it. And um, uh, the question, you know, from Patricia, she asked, did you implement any delivery through more online platforms like Uber Eats or DoorDash, et cetera? So, uh, so we did not do delivery or Uber Eats or anything, mainly because, um, we haven't, so we're not a full restaurant, right? We, we have pastries and things like that. And so our menu on Uber Eats, if they would allow it just to be beverage, I, I, I'm not sure if they do or don't, it would be very limited. Uh, but, but the biggest hurdle is that Uber Eats and DoorDash and some of these others, um, they take a big cut. They take, so, so in the case of Uber Eats, and a lot of people don't know this, they, they take 30%. And, and that's a lot, right? So what a lot of restaurants do I mean, we're talking restaurants, for people who don't know, if you're a high volume, very successful, very tightly run restaurant, if you're lucky, you're running at a 15% profit margin, if you're lucky. Most restaurants that are just normal, local, independently owned restaurants might be running 10%, I mean, in some cases, 5%. So if you're taking 30% right there, well, you're actually losing money. So what a lot of restaurants will do is, uh, they'll, they'll raise their prices if they go on Uber Eats, which that's always an option. I, I'm pretty conscious about price and I, I try not to be, I don't want to come off as a very expensive bar. I want it to be a place where everyone could come and everyone could afford it. Right. Uh, and we have nice things and we have things for, you know, that are $8 or $5. Right. And we do specials and all kinds of stuff. Um, so, so we didn't do Uber Eats. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that, were on the table that I looked at in the beginning in, in March and April that was like, what could we do? Should we, should we start selling this? Um, you know, and, and really it comes down to, okay, uh, uh, my staff is very limited for, for a month. It was just me. Uh, so what is going to give me the most value with not, I don't want to say the least work, but what, what is worth it, right? So what, what are we going to do that we can implement that is actually going to make a real effect? Um, and so when I looked at that, for us, it didn't make sense because we're, we don't have a lot of food. Now, if we were a restaurant, it might make sense. So, but we did do uh, the to-go cocktails. And luckily, we have a pretty big uh, social media presence on Instagram and now uh, building the email list as an effect of all this to try to reach people directly. And, and that's helped a ton. And, and uh, like I mentioned earlier, we're, we're fortunate. We have a really good following and our customers are awesome. So, um, so that helped in the beginning a lot and it actually still is helping a lot. So. That actually brings me to my next question. Were you able to track any data at all? The people that visited Intermezzo were any of them tourists or have you seen a decline in tourists? I was not able to track data, but, uh, you know, being in the edge district, we, I would say, you know, 80% of our, customer base is local already. Uh, whereas, you know, down on Beach Drive, it might be the reverse. Um, but, I, but I wasn't able to track any data from people. And, uh, and, and yeah, our, our volume decreased significantly. It was, it was mainly regulars. Most people, honestly, were doing it just, just out of sympathy. 
in the beginning and and now people are getting back in the flow of wanting to go out because we're keeping it clean and safe so yeah absolutely um Patricia also asked, what kind of direct effort support have you seen or experienced from the St. Pete community? Well, the city of St. Pete did offer a couple of grants, the Fighting Chance Fund, I believe was one, uh, which was a $5,000 grant to, you know, if you fulfilled certain requirements, which we did apply for that, I believe we got that one, uh, which is great. Um, so on the city end, we did get that. It, you know, it's been hard because you know, I don't, I don't blame the leaders in the community for saying like, you know, stay safe, stay home, be conscious of who you're around, et cetera. Um, you know, it, I, sometimes I want to, I want to chime in more and I want to say, Hey, that's good. But can you also tell them that like to support the places that are going out of their way to be safe or, well, what if, you know, what if you are, you're distancing and, and we provide outdoor seating, can you encourage people to go out and do that? because you're getting something from a conversation on both sides, which I totally understand, but it's like, don't go out. And then, but we're like, please come out, you know, as long as it's safe, please come out. Because if not, you know, then I don't know, we might not be here. So, um, but, but a lot of it, um, and I hate, I hate asking from people like on social media and stuff. I don't like to, I try to avoid saying like, please support, you know, like we're going through a hard time, please support us. Right. Um, but I think there's ways to do that by giving people value and by saying, you know, I'm not begging for your support, but I'm going to actually give you something to give you a reason to support us. Like for example, with the wine, we, you know, these wines are marked up very little, right. And so, but it's really just an incentive to come in, you get this bottle of wine, it's a deal for you. It gets you in the door. Maybe you buy a coffee while you're there. Um, so I try to kind of get creative with that, but, but the biggest support has been from, uh, from our regulars, our customers. So. Yeah, and I know me being one of your regulars, you have a good regular crew there. Um, have you decreased your monetary investment in paid social media advertisement? Yeah, that's a good question. So, um, yeah, we actually, I had someone on a, you know, on a retainer essentially doing we Facebook advertising, Instagram advertising uh, every month. And, and actually, January, February, March, well, the first half of March, were our best our best three months uh like the best first quarter i'll say compared to the last three years so we were really on track to have a phenomenal year and i think that's the case for a lot of, for almost everybody uh and 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 so i felt a lot more confident putting money into facebook advertising and etc and and just like little marketing things and merchandise and blah 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 things that we haven't really done before and uh and so yeah all that all that that was that was the first thing honestly that went away yeah awesome so uh wagner lost what amount of food do you need to sell in order to begin selling alcohol uh well so there's a couple of different ways to do that so uh in order for a bar to have a liquor license you can either get it through the state in which you have to fulfill certain requirements so um, I believe you need 51% food sales. You need uh, 2,500 square feet, if I'm not mistaken, and you need 150 seats. It's something like that. It might not be exactly like that. Now, the other way to get a liquor license is you just buy one, which is what we did, and it is a bigger upfront cost, but we knew we were going to be here for a while and et cetera. Um, so when you, when you own it, you don't technically need it. Now, but now in this context with coronavirus, what they said in the beginning was only restaurants can serve cocktails, which means that 51% uh, makes a restaurant. Then Florida made an amendment a few days later that said, if you have a food license, and this is where it gets frustrating, right? Because, because I found out about this amendment through another bar in Tampa, and I was just happened to be on online scrolling, and I'm like, wait a second, they're open, and then I read the comment, and, and then I'm like, okay, so there's an amendment now. So I found it and I printed it out and I, I keep it still at Intermezzo just in case there's any question on it and right next to our food license. And so the amendment said, if you have a food license, you're able to operate as a restaurant. Uh, so, so, so that's, that's why we're, we're open right now. And so if that answers your question. Uh, I have a question myself. What, um, 
what exactly changed uh, with Baum Avenue Market this year? Because yes. I noticed that a lot of those shops um, pre-COVID had left. Um, am I yeah. correct? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so my partner owns that building, and so I, in the beginning, I was uh, helping out and sort of giving my ideas. I'm not as, as involved anymore, but um, but we have a close relationship. So now. So what it used to be is Baum Avenue Market, meaning sort of like a, I used to say modern day food hall. There's four or five, I think at one point there's six different vendors in there uh, where you could go in and get different options. And it's, it's hard to pull off in that space. It wasn't specifically designed for that. So you're sort of, we were tasked with retroactively trying to fit that. And, um, and we were like, okay, this is, you know, I think they figured out that it was actually a little more difficult than they thought. What happened is Karma, who's now the tenant, Karma came in as a vendor, and they, and then after a month, they said we want more space. So they took two vendor vendor halls, and then they said we want more space, and they took three, and then finally they had a conversation with my partner and said we want the whole space, and we're willing to take the whole thing. We we think that we would be a good addition here, and blah blah blah, and so um, so they ended up working at a deal. So Karma now is. So, so technically, Bomb Avenue Market really is no longer. It's really Karma right now. So, which you know, I I love Karma, but I also loved having Twisted Indian and all these other great spots there. So, it's, you know. Yeah. With that being said, do you think um, you'll provide any sort of like food truck service? And if so, do you think that would help Green Bench with a food truck service? Because I'm thinking of three daughters and how they had their food truck. Did they have to get their license in order to have that food truck or is it an offhand thing? Cause I just, you, you said it yourself. There's so many restaurants, so many different things we hear all the time. Like what can that even be considered as something, you know, for, for yeah. your business or for, for green bench and to bringing more people there and having that ability to eat and enjoy beer at the same time. Um, yeah, so I, I'm i not sure about Three Daughters because I know they always have food trucks, but the, the question wasn't whether you could provide, provide food. It was if you had a food license. So they must have had a food license in order to stay open. I really don't know. Um, but for Green Bench, I don't believe they had a food license technically. And, and, and I really, I got to say, you know, I really, my heart goes out to Green Bench because they were one of the first businesses in St. Pete to take it as serious as it is now. They, from, from right off the bat, they voluntarily reduced their occupancy down to like <clears throat> 25% or 50%. They had a door person checking to make sure you had a mask. And if you didn't have a mask, they provided masks. They, you know, they, they set up a system to where you had to get in line to order and stand six feet away. And everything was served in pla you know, plastic and all this stuff. And they had everything. And then they were forced to shut down, even though that was like the safest place you could go, right? Probably. And so my heart goes out to them. They did a great job. And it's, it's, it's kind of unfair. But, um, you know, if it was as easy as just getting a food truck there, they would have it every day. But I think that it's, they need the license. And I'm sure that they're applying for it now. But and I don't know this for a fact, but my intuition tells me everyone's applying for it right now and that um, uh, there's probably a line and it's going to take a few weeks and you need an inspection and all these kinds of things. So I hope that they're pushing forward with it. Um, and I think they are, but, um, and, and as far as us, you know, we, we could have a food truck there for sure. Uh, it doesn't really, it's not going to affect, I mean, it might affect, it might bring some people there. Um, like you know just to get people in the door but it's not going to affect our stance as a bar or restaurant that's a really good question if i might be able to chime in here um so the fact that we that you would bring in a food truck those are probably still legally separate entities and very separate businesses that have their own licensing so as jared said um even if you were to be uh, even if you were a brewery and then you were you were to bring in a food truck on site to be able to have that food consumption that you're still separate legal entities and that 
that wouldn't really do anything for whether or not you can operate as a food establishment. Um, so the ones that are really hurting the most really are the ones that just have that license for alcohol consumption, right? So those are like your, your, your smaller breweries that don't really sell any food that bring those food trucks um, just as a, as a partnership, uh, as a contribution to each other, to, as Jared mentioned, to just probably bring in more people, which is very typical of the breweries. But yeah, um, along with that, there's a complication of interpreting those executive orders and the amendments to the executive orders and making sure that you're staying on top of it, but it's because it's not really like the state is really out there, uh, advertising the amendments to the executive orders or anything like that. Um, that's when um, your chambers of commerce um, really kind of like a step in to be able to interpret those executive orders for their members, for the community. Um, but um, it's, and it's really reading into the fine print and and then it, and then they have to have the complexity of like whether or not you bring in that 50% or more than 50% of, of food consumption or alcohol consumption, right? So it's really uh, very, and I've experienced that um, in, in my role here uh, with, with work uh, uh, as well. And um, many friends that are business owners um, here in Florida and in New York, and in, in New York as well, um, that are struggling with that. But um, uh yeah, yeah, I think that if I can say anything is um, make sure that you're doing as much as you can to support those local, um, you know, breweries, because those are the ones that are really, really hurting right, right now with the current yeah. executive order. Yeah, yeah, I think um, so, you know, I, 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 I understand the state of Florida, they're like, we don't want these bars open because what you see is you see the videos of pool parties with 300 people. And of clubs and people are, you know, dancing on top of each other and da da da. But the reality is, is that's only about maybe five percent of bars in the state, okay? And so what's happening is they issue this blanket statement that says all bars have to close now because you have five percent that sort of ruined it for everybody. But you know, and I try to have sympathy and I and I try to get, you know, people to have perspective on. Think about the ninety-five percent of bars. This is a big state, right? It's a very big state. So think about like a wine bar in the middle of like Ocala that is now that's barely getting by that has no more than six people in it on a Friday night that is shut down. And, you know, it's like the lady, it might be her retirement or his retirement or, or a, a younger person. It's their brand new bar and they're forced to shut down even though they're following the rules and they're doing this because a bar in Miami or, or downtown Tampa or something uh, uh, did that. So not to throw Tampa under the bus, but you know, go St. Pete. But um, so, so, so it's a, you know, it's, it's frustrating. And, um, and, uh, you know, if, if, if everyone was doing it right. Um, and, and also going back to the, the food truck point that, you know, I think the reason why they're not saying, okay, if you have a food truck, you're good to open is because you could park a food truck at, you know, PCI on St. Pete beach and still have 200 people there. Right. And so there, I think, uh, uh, you know, as I understand it, they're saying if you're a restaurant, then you have 50 percent occupancy and everyone's sitting down and everyone's spaced out. Uh, you know, look, there's always going to be the exception. People are finding their ways to to figure it out. They just want to cram people in, not because they want to defy the law, not because they want to make people feel unsafe, it's because they just don't want to lose their jobs or, or lose their business. So again, you know, it's, a, it's a tough issue. But uh, again, to your point, though, is I really encourage people this. I've always been a proponent, of course, of, of small business because for obvious reasons. And I grew up, you know, my family had a restaurant in, in little Mount Dora, Florida, right? And so I grew up in a community where people knew each other and we were, there was a lot of camaraderie, and et cetera. But it really hit home for me this time when I'm like, I never, I, I, I think about now, literally every dollar I spend, I'm like, I want to make sure that the money I spend goes in a family like like the owner's pockets and supports their family or supports their goal and so i really i'm not like anti-chain or anti big business at all but i'm also very pro local and so you know when i go out to eat i'm like i'm going to a local spot i want to get like you know i go to bodega for example or baba and i'm like i love 
George and Debbie, the owners, because I know that it supports them directly and I, I like them and I like to see them thrive. And that goes with, with all of everywhere I go is I want to try to try to um, encourage more of that. And, uh, you know, even with the wine thing, I'm like, you know, don't, don't why buy your wine at Publix when there's like 20 places within a mile of downtown St. Pete that sell great wine. And we might not have 500 bottles on the wall, but we have 20 that are really good. Right. And, and that kind of thing. Um, so. Yeah. It sounds like, you know, you've stayed connected with a lot of people in the St. Pete community um, in terms of, you know, hospitality owners, workers. Um, do you care to share at all? Like what other people have been saying or thinking or feeling and like, if you guys are, working together in any way, shape, or form to, you know, either communicate with the city or anyone else that, that could truly help? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm close with uh, the Green Bench people, and so um, we've talked a lot. We spent a lot of time over the, over the past few months together, and Nathan's wife, uh, who's one of the owners at Green Bench, his wife owns a women's clothing boutique. Uh, Sarah, she owns Miss Red Outfitters on Central Avenue. So I've gotten a perspective from retail. Um, and, but, but interestingly enough, her sales are, are good, right? Like she, she's actually done fairly well. I mean, she, in the beginning it was up and down, but overall it's been well because she was tooled up for this, meaning she had an online, she had an online outlet to sell and that kind of thing with easy, you know, returns and da da da. So it goes to show you how important technology is right now. Um, so people who were tooled up for this are, I uh, might be doing pretty well. Now, green bench, of course, not doing well. You're forced to shut down. You're, you're balancing, you know, it's, they say open one day. So they amp up production. And then two weeks later they say close. And not only does it affect them, but all the accounts that they sell. And that's a very popular brewery, right? Especially in the state. So accounts from, from Miami to the panhandle are now closed down. They just ordered a keg. But they're now saying, don't deliver that keg. We can't afford it. And it's stuck either at Green Bench or on the truck. So then the distributor is fighting with the brewery saying, who's going to pay for this and et cetera. So, um, you know, we, we've had multiple conversations of kind of like what to do. They, they, they didn't, you know, they, they're focusing more on retail, uh, but it's, it's limited, right? There's only so much you could do. So they opened up their tap room to do retail sales in the beginning. People bought a ton because every bar was closed and they were buying beer and drinking at home or going down to the park or the beach. But then restaurants quasi opened up, so their sales sank. Um, and there's just nothing you could do. I mean, there really isn't. We we brainstormed about it. I, I'm close with George and Debbie from Baba and, and Bodega. They had to, at Baba at least, they closed their lunch side because the volume was so low. They're still open for dinner, but they're not doing lunch right now. Uh, but Bodega is doing good. You know, it, it's bad timing because them, uh, among a lot of people, were in the middle of an expansion. They're expanding, they're moving their location next door. So there was a lot of money going out, a little money going in, and then this hits on top of it. So it's scary. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've talked to a bunch of people in the community and there's, there's really no answer, right? It's just, people are just trying to figure out how to survive. How, how can we just stay open? without getting in trouble or without being pressured or, or judged, right? Like we're trying to keep it clean, keep it, keep it safe um, and keep some money coming through the door and keep people's jobs, right? And, and not, not get rid of people's jobs. So that was, that was my number one thing. And that's, I think pretty much everyone I talked to is what are we going to do about our employees? Because, you know, a lot of these, these, these people, they, you know, hospitality is, it's like taking home cash at the end of the day, right? It's every day you have to rely on that. Uh, so, so luckily, you know, unemployment and stuff like that has helped, but um, yeah, I'm trying to think of any good other stories, but a lot of it is just trying to do to go cocktails, right? For bars. Like I know we've done it. The Benz is the Benz have done it now. So. Cool. Um, so we have a couple more questions and then we're going to wrap up. Um, Brittany asks, I've heard Florida representatives are talking about ways to reopen bars. Any insights on that or what you would like to see when that happens? Uh, well, they can, they can put bills together and recommend it, but ultimately I don't think anything's going to happen until, until, uh, you see some numbers decline. So, um, 
So I, I don't really have any insight on that. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think really it just kind of comes down to like what is, you know, the standard operating procedure in that case, and it's changing every day. Uh, it seems like, or it feels like, um, definitely. With that being said, you know, I've seen some places that are unable to really offer the same specials that they've offered in the past, whether it's like lunch specials or even staying open for lunch or cut their hours. Um, have your hours changed? Have your specials changed um, within your business at all? Yeah, well, yeah, so it's it's been, we've, we've changed it two or three times now, but now it's it's very consistent. So what we were doing is eight to, you know, we immediately shifted when, when Florida first nixed uh, all bars. So we, we shifted from, uh, you know, every day, all day, essentially. We're open usually all day until the late night. And we went to eight to 3 p.m. every day. So coffee only. Um, and then we opened back up and we closed. And so now what we're, where we're at and we're pretty, you know, confident it's going to stay this way for a while is we're open every day. Um, 8 a.m. until late at night, except on Monday and Tuesday, where it's only 8 to 3, uh, just because you don't have a lot of people going out. But Wednesday through Sunday, we're open 8 a.m. until, you know, 11 or on the weekends, 1 a.m. So we're, you know, we're trying to get back to normal. And, you know, the, the thing is, too, is I want to provide hours for people to work and and try to keep the business open and keep people coming through the door. So. Uh, we're, we're lucky, you know, we're not, we're not downtown. We're not a crazy high volume bar, right? We're a, a little bit more intimate. If you've ever been there, right? It's, it's, uh, everything's tables, right? No one stands, it's all table service. Tables are spaced out. Uh, it's, it's a little bit more slower paced, but, um, and more conversational driven and that kind of thing. Um, so it's, it feels like a good place to go during these times. And then as far as specials go, um, yeah, like that was one of the first things too, we nixed and we brought a lot of them back. So like right now we have happy hour every day from four to seven, except Monday and Tuesday, of course, because we're closed after the three, but it's four to seven, we have a killer happy hour. And then uh, within the next couple of weeks, we're bringing back our most popular cocktail special, which you know, which is the $5 old fashioned night on Wednesdays. So we'll bring that back soon. Yes, I um I told Jarrett before I'm like, are you bringing back that uh old fashioned Wednesdays? Cause that was my that was my day. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna end with one last question. Um, since we are running out of time here, uh, Jarrett, thank you so much for for being here again. Uh, Scott has a somewhat unrelated question. Sounds like he's uh, interested in your opinion on this, as am I. Uh, what would you like to see done with the trop? The city kicked off the RFP process this week. Yeah. Yeah, I saw that. I'm excited to see some of those come in. Um, you know, I would love to have Major League Baseball in this city, to be honest with you. I think that now that the edge is built up and you have all like a lot of people living now in the edge district, you have within the last two years, two years, you've had five or six separate apartment complexes be built, each with 400 plus units. So there's a lot of people living there, which has never happened in the history of St. Pete in that neighborhood. So, you know, we're fortunate to be right in the middle of that neighborhood. Uh, and now that we have that, I think that if the stadium was done right and the edge worked with the city and worked with MLB, that it could be a perfect community for that if it was done right. Um, so, so I would like to have the race here. I mean, I would love to have the race here, but if they don't want to be here uh, or it doesn't make sense, then I would love to see that be redeveloped as multi-use. I mean, I think we need to, we need, we need offices, right? There's a huge uh, demand for office space right now. Um, and I think that if you did like sort of a business park, right, you did offices, you did some retail, uh, some hospitality, uh, you know, maybe a, a grocery store or something like that, that would be, that would be awesome as well. So um, you know, that's, that's what I'm really excited for, for the future of St. Pete is drawing bigger companies here and trying to get more offices and, and professionals here, uh, younger professionals. So, and more people to join the St. Pete young entrepreneurs. <laughs> yes. Yeah, definitely. Well, very cool. Um, I know I will, I will be by sometime this week or next to, to for happy hour, um, grab a cocktail, even a wine to go. Um, so yeah, again, thanks so much for taking time out of your day to speak with us. Um, I know everyone here learned a lot from you today. Um, so 
thanks again. And uh, we look forward to seeing you soon and hopefully hosting another, you know, SPYP happy hour connect because I know we've done a couple with you and it's a great space to, to hold that. So once we can start reserving that space again in a safe way, um, I would love to, to do so with you. So thanks again. Thanks everyone for awesome. joining us and um, have a great rest of your day. Have a good week. Thanks guys. All right. Bye.